Evening all. Um, thank you again for being with us. Um, slight change in our timing. We were um, scheduled to be here last night, but uh, um, this evening we're reporting uh, 11 new cases of COVID-19 uh, notified in the last 24 hours, bringing the total to 25,414. We're reporting an additional three notifications of deaths in the last 24 hours, bringing the total to 1,731,730. Uh, 727 of whom uh, occurred in a hospital environment, that's 42%, um, 90 of which occurred in intensive care units, that's 5.2%. Uh, there were 1,599 1, uh, where we have reports of underlying medical conditions, that's 92%. Uh, 855 were males, 875 female. Uh, in terms of admissions to intensive care, a total at this point of 434, 12 cases in ICU as things stand this morning, um, and 24 in total in hospitals. Uh, no new admissions to intensive care in the last 24 hours, uh, two new admissions to hospital over the last 24 hours, and then just briefly in relation to residential care facilities, 473 notified outbreaks, 345 of which have been denotified having uh, achieved the, the status of 28 days without uh, a case, 257 of which are nursing homes, 190 of which have been um, uh, denotified now. Uh, in terms of cases, 7,137 cumulatively associated with residential care facility residents, 5,609 of which are in respect of nursing homes. And the share of deaths, uh, 1,093, 1093 in respect of residents of residential care facilities. 970 of which were residents of nursing homes. Um, I have some uh, additional data that I just want to share with you and just in terms of our picture as compared to some other countries, uh, particularly in the context of travel. Um, a couple of slides here, if you bear with me. So that just shows numbers of confirmed cases. Uh, this is at a global level. It's WHO source data for the last 17 day, seven days, I should say, by country, territory or area from the 19th to the 25th of June shows us between one and 100, um, and the light yellow, you'll see the gradation going all the way down, and you can see the various parts of the world. Uh, I think I've made the point in general terms before that maybe four, six, maybe eight weeks ago, Europe was very much the epicenter of this infection, uh, and you can see the relative uh, position of Europe compared to most many other parts of the world now. This is um, a disease which is accelerating, uh, as the WHO has said, uh, globally. Uh, and presenting a challenge to all parts uh, of the world, as you can see from that picture. Um, this data here shows us in terms of our 14-day incidence. Uh, what I'm showing you here in the first instance is the, uh, it's, it's organized by uh, incidence as calculated over the previous um, 14 days, so which is the column on the right. So it's 14-day um, incidence uh, in countries across the Europe, Euro 27, uh, including the UK. Um, uh, the, the highest 14-day incidence is 152 cases over that time period per 100,000 reported in Sweden. And you can see where Ireland is at when this table was done when we were at 3.4. In fact, we know in terms of incident cases in the last 24, sorry, 14 days, uh, we're in fact lower than that at this point. Um, uh, and you can see uh, the range of countries that are reporting rates that are better than us are Slovenia, Greece, Finland. Cyprus, Lithuania, Slovakia, Estonia, Latvia, and Hungary. Many of the countries with which we would normally have a sort of a holiday relationship where people would tend to go on holidays are reporting as, as things stand uh, incidents um, in, uh, uh, in excess of ours uh, in terms of 14-day incidents. You will see Italy, France, uh, Spain, Portugal, um, uh, and countries like that higher than us on that list. And then if I look at it, this is exactly the same data, but now just organized in terms of uh, the percentage improvement over the last um, um, 14 days. In other words, the extent to which there's been a change in the 14-day instance that we report in the last 14 days as compared to the 14 days prior to that. And the same comparison across different countries, and you can see uh, that we have um, one of the most improved uh, across um, the whole of the EU. Um, so ours, our, our level low and getting lower, and that's been the situation for some time. And that's not the pattern that's uh, exhibited in a number of countries. That black line will show you right across the middle there. Uh, that's the point of demarcation between countries that are reporting lower rates in the last 14 days than in the previous 14 days. Those above that line are countries where the 14-day incidence, in fact, has increased. 
And again, just take a moment to look at some of the countries there and the percentage increases that are being reported in some of them. So this is a dynamic situation, as we've said before, a changing situation. And for anybody thinking in terms of holidays and plans, a week, two weeks down the line makes a big difference in the transmission of this virus. Uh, and yeah, so I'm going to hand over then to uh, Philip. Thank you very much. Thanks, Philip. So um, just to, this will take a moment to come up, I'm sure. Very good. So just to remind you, I'm sure you all know this, that a great deal of the data uh, that you see here previously on a daily basis and now on a twice weekly basis uh, is published on the national COVID website uh, as a partnership between uh, HSE, HPSC, Ordnance Survey, uh, Central Statistics Office and some of our own colleagues uh, in Maynooth University. So there's a rich and growing data set available for, for those who are interested in, in monitoring uh, the disease. Um, I'm very pleased to confirm, uh, in one sense, a very positive picture uh, that, uh, as has been happening for several weeks now, all of the indicators of COVID-19 in Ireland are either stable at very low levels or continuing to decline. Um, we, we've had a significant decrease in this week uh, in the number of cases confirmed per day. So several weeks back, we were looking at 50 or 60 uh, cases per day. We've been looking at 15 to 20 for the last two weeks, and that's now just at uh, nine uh, cases on average uh, reported between this Wednesday and the preceding Wednesday. Uh, we continue to test uh, at the levels that tests are required, several thousand tests a day, but the percentage of positive tests uh, is continuing to decrease to now very low levels of positivity at 0.4% at on average over the last week. Um, we uh, had 40 people in hospital uh, on average. That's now down in the 20s. It's down yes. as low as 24. Yeah. Um, and uh, very low levels of admission to hospital, two admissions uh, per day, and that's been stable for some weeks now. Um, the average number of people in intensive care uh, at 14, uh, down from 24 uh, the preceding week. And we have, again, uh, very typically uh, one admission um, every five days uh, to an intensive care and we're reporting uh, typically two deaths per day. So um, no, not only is there no increase in the level of disease uh, several weeks on from the 8th of June, uh, but there's continuing decrease. This is just to assure you that the level of testing remains constant in the, in the 2,300 to 2,600 range, uh, but on my apologies, that should be 0.4. Um, uh, of the test positive. And again, if we look at the number of cases reported here every day, now we know that sometimes tests, uh, cases are reported that for one reason or another are, 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 are a little bit older, but just looking back over the last five weeks, the last three weeks uh, are in stark contrast with the preceding two weeks where we're seeing very low numbers of cases reported each day with one or two exceptions and therefore a very low average number of cases. Uh, reported each day. However, I do want to sound two notes of uh, caution. Uh, this is the uh, how the cases are distributed across age um, by the, the date the test was done, the date the swab was collected. This is actually for the entire pandemic, and we're looking at all cases in the community, if I can put it that way. So we're, we're excluding from this analysis uh, healthcare workers and residents in long-term residential care. Uh, and you'll see until recently, the age breakdown of the disease uh, has been very stable, uh, very low numbers uh, in those under 20, uh, and then relatively stable numbers across the different age groups. But in uh, the last two weeks, uh, the number of cases emerging in the 20 to 39 age group, and this is a zoom in on the period since the 20th of May, you can see that widening light blue band uh, representing the cohort uh, 20 to 39 years of age. Uh, representing an increasing proportion of disease, disease so that now the under 64s, uh, sorry, the under 40s uh, represent uh, half of the emerging uh, cases. So it's just an important time to remind everybody that young people are vulnerable to this disease uh, uh, and vulnerable to the transmission of this disease. And then the second area that we're 
always watching is where are the new cases emerging. Um, uh, and it, wh where we're now seeing is that most cases are isolated, um, that they're not associated with any kind of cluster of disease. They're emerging in households or extended families. Uh, so that's the light gray bar. Uh, almost 60% of cases are in those settings. Uh, it, week 25 is last week, by the way, so we wait for all the data to come in before analyzing it. Uh, there were no cases associated with outbreaks in workplaces, for instance, last week. The remaining cases were in healthcare workers, uh, about a quarter of all cases, and uh, a small number of cases uh, in some settings in long-term residential care. And then how is the virus being transmitted? Um, there, there's very complete data on how people are picking up the infection uh, over the last several weeks. So about a fifth of cases uh, last week and in preceding weeks were close contacts of known cases. Uh, a little bit more than 30% were community transmission or possible community transmission. Uh, again, a little bit more than 30% uh, uh, up to, uh, acquired in a hospital setting or nosocomial. What you'll see again, and I highlighted it last week, uh, uh, an increasing proportion of cases uh, relating to travel. So the red bar is travel. It was uh, an important mode of uh, uh, getting the disease early in the pandemic, disappeared, of course, uh, in the middle of the pandemic when uh, nobody was traveling uh, and is now beginning to, to reemerge. So those two trends uh, in the uh, behavior of the disease are noteworthy. Uh, it, it's it's uh, increasing incidence in younger people and the increasing uh, incidence of tra travel-related infection. And then, as I've said to you before, uh, I know everybody's keen to know what the reproduction number is, and we're keen to tell you that the thing that really matters is the number of cases and where they're emerging. Uh, nonetheless, if we have a very stable or decreasing number of cases, that means the reproduction number remains very low. Uh, uh, we have a variety of estimates, most of them relate to what was going on uh, 10 to 14 days ago. Um, the most recent uh, techniques, the general additive methods, do give us up-to-date estimates, and that suggests that the reproduction number is somewhere between 0.5 uh, and 0.7 uh, over the last two weeks. So very low transmission of the virus uh, within the community by all counts, and then some areas where we do have specific concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Shane. Hi, I'm Shane Beattie from News Talk. Just picking up on um, Professor Nolan's point there about travel. Um, there's a lot of talk today, obviously, about this green list which was announced last night. They were putting together this green list of countries. It'll be available the 9th of July. Um, Aer Lingus are critical of it. They say they want more details of it. Other travel experts are saying that they think it's going to be impossible and unworkable. Are you fully comfortable with this green list of countries that we're going to get a list where we'll be told that you can go to this country unrestricted travel and come back and not have to quarantine? So the principle of it in public health terms, if we have a situation where we have verif verifiable information, in other words, information that we can trust about another country that tells us that the level of incidence they have in that country is at or below a threshold that makes sense from our point of view or at or below the level that we're at, then sharing of travel between those two countries, assuming the travel process itself uh, happens in line with public health guidance. It uh, doesn't create an increase in the risk of transmission uh, relative to the transmission rate that would be here. So, uh, and there's no country that has eliminated this virus. So each country is reporting a threshold or a level, particularly countries that we have close travel relationships with. Uh, there are many countries uh, that were we, to con were we to construct a list of such countries now where A, we could trust the information and B, we could establish that that, le that level of information, that the information related to that country tells us that, the, that, that they are another country of low transmission and low instance of the disease. Uh, there would be a lot of countries in Europe not on that list. We'd also want to know that the, the level that they had was a level that was a decreasing one and not an increasing one. So the many countries that may well be reporting low levels of transmission now, uh, but the, that level is an increasing one uh, as opposed to a decreasing one. We have a low level of transmission in this country. And we have a low, and, and we have a reducing level of transmission. So that, and, and, and we trust our own data, and we have confidence in that, uh, and that that tells us uh, um, 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 
and gives us assurance, if you like, in relation to the transmission of the disease in the country. We need a, we need a similar level of assurance. And the concept then uh, would be that were we to be in possession of trust, trustworthy information at the 9th of July uh, that met the criteria that we think are important, uh, then we could construct a list of those countries. But there are many countries that right now would not be on such a list. Uh, and it's, not, it's quite impossible, given that today is the, what is it, the 26th of June, um, that, uh, to say what countries would be on that list on the 9th of July. Mm. Because if you ask me what countries would have been on such a list, if we constructed such a list a week ago, some of those countries would not be on that list today. And I accept that that creates a challenge for people in terms of uh, plans, in terms of forward booking. But our public health advice is still the same. We are recommending avoidance of all non-essential travel uh, from this country, of people who live here, people who are planning travel outside of the country. We're asking to avoid planning travel at this point in time. Uh, and we're asking people who would be tourists planning trips to this country to avoid traveling to here. And as Professor Nolan has shown, we've now seen the emergence of uh, a number of cases. Uh, in relative terms, it might be a small number, but it's an increasing share of the transmission of this infection that we're seeing in this country. Um, the source of infection that we're seeing in this country associated with travel. Uh, people who've come here from a number of other European countries, uh, some parts of Asia, uh, and from North America in the last 14 days and bringing infection into the country. We're worried about that. We're worried about the extent to which that will continue to happen. And if travel increases, uh, then the rate of importation of infection will increase. Uh, but, but what was announced last night was, was, was the concept of in a situation where we could both trust and verify that we could have a relationship with another country that had a similar or lower level of, of infection. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and the plans, essentially, to announce that list uh, on the 9th of July. But it's impossible to predict what countries would meet that test. Our, our, our growing sense, if you like, in terms of the experience of Europe uh, in, this, in, 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 in the last week or two weeks is that there is a considerable risk, and we're seeing it play out in a number of countries, of increasing incidence and a resurgence of the infection in either whole countries or, or in, or in sub-regions, if you like, or provinces or, 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 or sub-national regions of, of countries across, across Europe. It sounds, <clears throat> it sounds like you're nervous about any increase in travel then. Yeah, I'm beyond nervous. Um, there were widespread rumours politically yesterday that you were very unhappy with the announcement that was going to be made about a list and about creating any sort of expectation that by the 9th of July there would be a list of places people could go. Is that true? Were you unhappy yesterday? I've told you that we're concerned about travel as a potential source of infection for this country. Uh, it makes sense to me to be in a situation whereby if there's to be travel happening, and we have travel happening on the island, so we move around the island, uh, and in a situation where we think people are moving from one place where the transmission rate, and we know it to be broadly similar to other parts, we think then travel is appropriate. If we extend that to the international scene, uh, if there are countries uh, that, that have, as I say, verifiable information, um, that um, um, it tells us that they are either below a threshold that makes sense to us in terms of a level of infection or below the level of infection we have here, uh, then, then we can contemplate such arrangements. And the, the concept of such a list is, is to come up with countries that might meet that criteria. If we were constructing such a list today, and if it was based only, for example, on countries that had a better than us reported 14-day cumulative incidence rate, it's a relatively modest number of countries and for the most part, uh, um, I, I can imagine very nice countries to visit, I've no doubt, but not necessarily the countries that people from this country would usually or traditionally tend to, to visit. So at this time of the year, when people think about Europe, the, it, it, the, the, the Frances and Spains and Portugals and, um, um, and so on would be the kinds of places, and Italy's and so on would be the kinds of places that we'd all be thinking about going on holidays to. Um, all of these countries would be above us on the list where we'd constructed today. And even if there were countries on the list, it would it still be your preference that people don't travel? Yes. Even if the countries were on the list on the 9th of July? Oh, so for the 9th of July, yeah. the 9th of July, we'll get to the 9th of July, and what we're doing is work both uh, in our membership of ECDC as a country, and ECDC are working on this at a European level, the construct of arrangements to support this concept of air bridges. What will be the criteria? What will be the mechanism to ensure that it's... A, that these criteria and the reports of information from countries against those criteria can be trusted. ECDC will be helping and need to, need to, um, uh, uh, to be part of that process from our point of view, that we can trust that information. And just finally, for, for people who do decide to travel, um, 
what advice do you have for them? And, and what about things like travel insurance, if people have travel insurance, and then consider what advice you're giving and what you're saying here this evening? Um, so at the moment, the Department of Foreign Affairs is a very clear travel advisor in relation to non-essential travel, and I'm no expert in insurance. But my understanding is that would invalidate travel insurance for all, for all, let's say, health care that, that travel insurance would normally co cover. That is my understanding. If I was, an if I was a traveller who was travelling to a region for a non-essential purpose, uh, under such a restriction as we have at the moment, that advisory that we avoid non-essential travel to those regions, I would be checking my travel insurance to make sure that it covered me in the event of any uh, ill health that I had or any member of my family had abroad. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Zara King, Virgin Media News. Um, just following up on the travel questions from Shane there. So yesterday you had said NEF had expressed a clear view that overseas travel poses a risk to the importation of the disease and to further transmission in Ireland. And you've reiterated that several times this evening. Um, yet, I suppose we're hearing from government yesterday about the green list and the possibility of travel resuming in July. And we're hearing from all of the airlines that they are quite excited to resume travel as well. But you're not on the same page, I'm correct in saying that. I mean, you would much prefer people to do staycations this summer, is that correct? So, uh, certainly, I think that planning staycation would be a good thing. Uh, it, it wouldn't involve the, tra the risk of travel to other countries uh, that I've just described. Uh, the process of travel uh, itself is one that will have to be you know, carefully managed to try to ensure that as we travel through airplanes and airports and so on, the risk of transmission in those settings is minimised and that they, there is compliance with public health advice. So yes, of course, staycation makes sense uh, and it fits with, I think, something we've seen very well over the course of this entire pandemic, the, the, the solidarity of the whole of the population, the whole of the community supporting one another through this. Uh, and so I certainly intend to, if I manage to get a few days off, to ensure that I spend whatever money I can spend uh, in this country, supporting business and, and, and uh, activity in this country. Uh, in terms of the, the, the work of governments uh, to try to find a basis, along with a number of other countries at a European level, to find a safe basis upon which we can resume airline travel makes sense. So, but we, what we will want to ensure and what the government wishes to ensure is that that is safe in the first instance. And that's why I stress uh, that it will be on the basis of criteria that can be verified, that it will be reported levels of incidents that make sense relative to the incidents that we might experience in this country, uh, and that we're not uh, opening up uh, arrangements to countries that represent a risk in terms of importation on the basis that there are higher transmission levels in those countries. Uh, and as you can see, the list of countries and the, and, and the nature of the countries that are higher than that on the list, even just in Europe, leave, leave, leave alone uh, other countries in other part of, parts of the world. Uh, there are very many more countries, in fact, at a higher level than us, than, than, than below us. Uh, in terms of airlines, I can understand entirely the position of airlines and, 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 and there are airlines I know who are marketing uh, for understandable reasons, um, services and flights and so on to the population. Um, uh, for, for public health reasons, my advice to the public is to, to listen to us in terms of uh, public health advice uh, and not to the airlines. And so realistically then looking at the list there, as you say, anywhere kind of below Ireland then, if we were to make the green list today, would possibly be on that list. So you're looking at places like Hungary, Latvia, Estonia, Slovakia, Lithuania, these types of places that might make the well, list eventually. Well, well, that table isn't necessarily yeah. the, the application of the yeah. criteria, but yes, I mean, if you were looking at it today, you'd be looking you at factors. You have to make a decision today so we're looking, look at that, yeah, yeah. We're looking at the level and we're, we're also looking at what's happening. And is that an increasing rate or is it a decreasing rate? Mm -hmm. So our rate is both low and, and reducing. Uh, some other countries are high and increasing, but there are countries there that have low rates, but low rates that are now increasing. Okay. So all of those things w would be taken into account in, an, in any set of sensible criteria. And hypothetically speaking, if you booked your holiday to Hungary or Latvia and you go away on your holiday and then the list changes while you're on holiday, when you come back then, will you be expected to quarantine for 14 days? How will that work logistically? Well, all of those details have to be worked out. Because okay. Taoiseach said last night, the arrangements that have to be put in train to uh, uh, potentially operationalise such a list are the arrangements that have to be worked on, not just by Ireland, but, but by other countries. And then if there was to be any co other country that was, that was part of any such green list, the bilateral arrangements that would have to exist between us and that country, that would all have to be worked out over the course of the period of time between now and the, and the 9th of July. And, and you're absolutely right. Some of those kinds of technical questions will arise. 
Because it's quite complicated, actually. It, it, it is. It's not as straightforward as we thought it, maybe yesterday. It is not announced. straightforward. Yeah. No. Okay, I just wanted to ask you, I'm not sure if you may or may not have seen footage today, Dr. Houlihan, uh, that's emerged of a rave that took place, I believe, in Stephen's Green yesterday. Um, there was a number, a large number of young people uh, in the afternoon enjoying themselves, as we all do when we're young. Um, but I suppose, based on the figures that we're getting tonight and, and the message coming from Professor Philip Nolan, are you concerned about that kind of a gathering? Well, Albeit that it's outdoors, I, but... I, did, I didn't see the rave. But okay. I, 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 I travelled home along the, the, the Grand Canal last night uh, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of people along there. They were wedged in beside each other um, um, like as if there was nothing going on. Uh, and uh, I think there's, there was genuine concern on our part that perhaps for some, of, some parts of the community, uh, for very understandable reasons, people want to get back to normal activity that the message maybe isn't fully being um, 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 getting through. Uh, and our concern is without in any sense wishing to express blame or point fingers, we are showing the data is telling us that young, pe young people are accounting for a higher percentage of the cases. And I think that gives, us rise, that gives rise from our point of view to maybe further concern because I think we have good reason to believe anecdotally that uh, many people who are planning travel outside the country are in fact young people as well. And so, uh, I, I mean, that's a kind of double risk, if you like, in terms of uh, our public health message. Uh, so we're saying, uh, um, in, in terms of travel, we're saying in terms of young people, uh, to listen to the public health advice. Please, Siobhan, yeah. Just for younger people, you know, it has been an extraordinarily difficult time, but we're now finding that people are taking longer from the time of development of symptoms to going to getting tested. Uh, so if you do develop symptoms and you are some, you know, try and keep a good, good record of your contacts and be as honest as possible if you do test positive. And also, if you do develop symptoms, don't ignore them. I know it's the hay fever season and some of the symptoms are similar, but don't ignore them. Do get medical advice and do get the help that you need. Just two really quick ones then, just at the end. Um, maternity hospitals, uh, expectant partners of expectant mothers have been messaging me and campaigning for greater access. Um, are we any clearer on that? I asked the HC the other day and they said NEFIT was to consider it, so. Okay, so we're, we're working on that. Uh, we're working on guidance for visiting to across the healthcare sector. Obviously, there's going to have to be local arrangements depending on the size of the hospital and how many people they can have in, but that's being worked on at the moment. And when do we think we'll have an answer on that? I would hope we'd have guidance out in the next week or two. In the next week or two. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. And finally, um, Dr. Hulin, sleepovers mm. for grandparents. When can the kids go for a sleepover at granny and granddad's? When is it safe to do that? Look, as we move along through this, it's, it's going to be appropriate for people to start to make some of their own assessments of these things. We, we've given clear advice in relation to people who are in the cocooning age groups, the over the age of 70, people with underlying medical conditions. Um, uh, we've given clear advice in terms of social distancing and so on. Um, uh, we, we will continue to emphasize the need for people in the vulnerable groups to be cautious um, and to take as many precautions as possible. But we know and we understand that normal life uh, will resume and will have to resume in various ways. And our job will be, as we move through this and as people now begin to uh, um, uh, get back, if you like, to usual normal economic, social, family activity, that some of these kinds of activities are gonna happen. Our role is going to be to continue to monitor the impact of this disease. Uh, it's spread through the community where the particular uh, challenges are, are arising and to give our advice and guidance in relation to that. But we'll continue to emphasize the importance for people um, in the vulnerable groups to take every measure they possibly can, familiarize themselves with the kind of information that we have in the Stay Safe guidelines uh, that, 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 that are going to be made uh, available for all of the various different settings in which people will find themselves. What are the simple measures that you need to take to try to protect yourself and to try to limit transmission uh, of the infection? So to be clear, for grandparents that mightn't be immune compromised, who might be fit and able, can they start to take the grandkids for sleepovers from next so, week? So we, we've talked about the importance of people not from different households not mixing with one another okay. uh, and limiting the amount of time that people spend at various stages all the way through this. We've never, we've never got down to the level of sort of telling people when it's appropriate not to hug and, and when to hug and so on. That's not, uh, these, these are decisions that people have to take for themselves. Mm -hmm in full knowledge of the information that we have given in terms of how the virus transmits and what measures you can take as an individual to, 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 um, uh, to protect yourself. And the answer to that question is going to, is going to be different for different individuals yeah. and, and different individuals in the same will take different decisions because the practical issues that might arise in fact. So this, a sleepover in one particular family might be a vital form of child support and another family it might be more of a 
a luxury. And in some situations, it might be something that happens very regularly. In other situations, something that happens infrequently. Okay, thank you. you. Uh, Stephen McDermott, with the journal that I use. Uh, just following on from Zara's question there, um, people who are kind of in intimate relationships but not living in the same household, you're talking about the rise in the number of cases among young people. Um, what's your position on people kind of having sleepovers if they're a bit older? I don't think we call those sleepovers. Um, um, I think our advice remains the same, that in relation to any form of uh, intimate contact, that uh, reducing numbers of partners, reducing activity reduces levels of infection. But obviously, there are other considerations that apply. Uh, and for, but for people who are living apart from one another, uh, we're no longer recommending that people stay... Uh, that people stay uh, not in contact with people from other households. That's no longer part of our, our recommendation. We recognize that that now happens and will happen. And we've never specifically said uh, that people can't and shouldn't. Uh, there, are, there is clear guidance available through the HPSC website in relation to, uh, and through, through, um, um, through the HSE website. Uh, the, 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 uh, the crisis pregnancy program, and I'm trying to recall the precise name of the website as I'm speaking to you, it'll come to me in a second, but there's good and clear guidance in relation to sexual health, the prevention of transmission of sexual, sexually transmitted infections, and much of that kind of guidance will make sense in terms of the transmission of this particular infection. Uh, one of the other things that happened in the last recent days is the mandatory wearing of face masks on public transport. Was that a recommendation by the National Public Health Emergency Team? That was a decision of the government. But did you recommend it to them? Or? No, we, did, we didn't specifically recommend the mandatory, but it makes sense because it makes sense to us, uh, uh, it's a balanced assessment that's been made in relation to the management of public transport as public transport activity is is and will increase, and although we've shown you data here before that shows although it's increasing, it's increasing at a slower rate than many other forms of transport, so people are choosing to walk and they're choosing to drive and cycle and so on more to work and in, in terms of regular activities than they're choosing to use public transport. But as we see more economic and social and cultural and activity increase, we expect to see more activity in terms of um, public transport. Lots of good measures have been taken by the public transport authorities to try to uh, uh, facilitate social distancing, uh, to try to maintain services, to try to stagger um, 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 uh, services, and with workplaces doing similarly in terms of maintaining as much as possible, which is very clearly still our recommendation, people work from home wherever possible, limit their uh, attendance at work. When you take all of these kinds of measures into account, it should, re have a, it should reduce the pressure on public transport, but at the same time, we do expect that people will use public transport more and more, and it is one of the settings that we've said uh, consistently that as people use public transport, it will be difficult to maintain social distancing, and for that reason, we have always recommended, um, um, since we introduced a recommendation around um, use of face coverings in, 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 in the community, we've always recommended um, the use on public transport. And the government's decided that the best way of, in, in, of, of balancing, if you like, all the considerations, the need to maintain all of the public health advice, maintain the viability and operation of a range of services that are provided by public transport companies, uh, that, that, that this measure be introduced, and we have no issue with that. Okay. Uh, just one last one for me for uh, Philip Nolan. Uh, just on the rise in uh, cases related to travel, do we know specifically what countries are coming from and if it's related to tourism or...? Um, so we do. Uh, I think the Chief Medical Officer has already given you a flavour of it. We're talking about countries like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan on the one hand, um, uh, Portugal, Sweden, Ukraine, the United Kingdom, uh, and um, a number of cases from the United States. So they're, they're distributed both in geography and they're distributed um, in purpose. Um, not able to give you the details of the precise purpose of any of those uh, travel-related cases, it's a variety of purposes. Uh, just in terms of the slides that you showed us, like we could sort of see it visually, but by what percentages specifically has it increased in the last week or two? Oh, well, well it was accounting for zero percent uh, for some period of time, and it's it's now in the... Uh, just after, I mean, I, I know the number of cases, it's, it's uh, 13 over two weeks, um, so it's a little bit less than six percent um, You're in saying, the last so week, thirteen from zero. Exactly. I mean, that's the important thing. Uh, uh, it, it's a very significant increase. I, I won't go back to the slide, but uh, they'll be published afterwards. Um, uh, so it's less than ten percent, 
um, but significant in its re-emergence. Thank you very much. You. Good evening. Um, just wanted to ask on uh, Monday seems the largest reopening of the society and uh, economic activity that we've seen so far. Uh, and we're talking tonight of extremely low figures of uh, transmission uh, in various kind of factors. Uh, would you be able to give people assurance, people who, to, that they're you know safe to go back out and start enjoying the things that are opening up on Monday to give them that confidence that they can go back out? Um, well, first of all, it comes from the transmission of the virus, so that's the first thing that we're looking at. Uh, but also at the the the, um, the maintenance of a high level of compliance on the part of the public with public health advice. We are focusing in on areas that give us so, give us concern. We've talked about those in terms of travel, in terms of other social activities, uh, and maybe some um, portions of the population, young people in particular. So we've highlighted some of those things. But in general, we've seen across the population a continued maintenance of a high level of compliance with public health advice. That gives us confidence. Uh, but as we move now to a situation whereby, as you rightly say, you know, much of the economy, uh, much of society uh, is, is getting back to normal and, 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 you know, usual levels of activity while maintaining a high level of, of compliance with the public health advice, uh, our role will be to focus now on what what the impact of that is in terms of transmission of the disease and to watch very, very closely. That was one of the reasons I've said that we look really closely now every day and obviously the numbers of new cases and all the new data that occurs in that day, but to continue to look at the, the most recent 14 days, we're treating in effect the most recent 14 days of our experience of this infection as though it were a new infection and trying to sensitize everybody to the fact that like, although these are low numbers of cases, we really need to be very careful that we don't start to see a small change, then we pick that up very, very quickly. Um, um, and we can all become a little bit, as it were, uh, uh, desensitized because it's not that long ago since the numbers I was giving you here each day was like 600 and 700 and 800, and the numbers that I'm giving you now are six and seven and eight. So it's a very changed situation. But we have to watch the trends that might occur uh, very, very closely. So we're treating that most recent set of data um, uh, as though it was a new infection and, and watching it with that kind of degree of, of sensitivity and, and, and care. Um, and so we think if we continue to take those kinds of measures, um, um, that if something happens, and a number of countries, uh, in spite of their best efforts around easing of restrictions, have seen resurgence of infection, uh, if that is to happen here, if we're to see an outbreak in a particular area, if we're to see a generalized resurgence in the incidence of the disease, we need to be in a position to pick that up as quickly as possible. It's one of the reasons why we're now focusing on after uh, uh, we get to the end of the easing of restrictions, what might be the arrangements that would be in place were we to see a resurgence of the disease. Uh, it wouldn't, as I've said on many occasions, be the same set of measures that we put in place as a country um, on those three separate occasions over the course of, of the month of March. We'll watch very closely. Uh, I don't want to be sector singling out in um, particular, but we'll watch. I mean, there are parts of you know where we're focused in on that do give us cause for concern. We 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 know that we're going to see, uh, and we're all welcome it. Uh, restaurant activity starting to happen. As a, if I was to choose one example, over the course of the next number of weeks, and restaurants, we hope very many of them will 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 be able to open again, and that people will be able to enjoy that experience. Some of the pubs will begin to open as restaurants. The extent to which we see people behaving both in terms of publicans and the public behaving responsibly in relation to all that, that will continue to give us encouragement as we move towards the, the next set of, uh, of easing restrictions. And we'll watch that uh, and the extent to which we see um, uh, continued high level of, if you like, responsibility. The parts of the economy and society that are open, I've said it on many occasions, for example, retailers, those that have been open since the very beginning have been really responsible. Uh, and have led the way very often in, in the measures that they've taken themselves to try and protect both their staff and the public. If we continue to see that uh, um, through the, the businesses and the organizations and the services that are opening uh, again from Monday, that will continue to, to, to have us express confidence. Mm. So you've said you'd be you know, confident to go on a staycation yourself or something like that and support local economy. So presumably where the public health uh, advice is being adhered to, you'd be, you'd be confident yourself to go and enjoy a restaurant or enjoy a bar that's behaving responsibly. I would look forward to it, so I'm honest, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. um, sorry, I just wanted to ask, you, you mentioned a couple of times uh, the trust factor in terms of foreign co other countries in terms of travel. Is there a particular concern around the trust in figures in any particular countries we're talking about, or is that a, no, it's a not systematic thing, it's the ECDC numbers? 
It's not so much trust in the sense of, you know, not, but different countries have different testing arrangements, for example, in place that can then change, if you like, or give. So we have to not just know what the level of cases are, like there are other factors that we would take into account, what the testing practice is in a country, and there are very different practices in different countries, and then also what the positivity rate is. So if we just reflect in this country, you've heard me saying that our incidence rate is low, uh, that it's falling. Uh, all the other measures of the disease are also falling at this moment in time. We're testing at a high rate in relative terms, uh, and the positivity rate from that testing is very low. Now, not every country in Europe that we're proposing is in a position to be able to, to make the statements that I've just made uh, um, in terms are of... Are there any in particular that you're concerned about in terms of those things? Well, you, you can see the... Like, so it's not our... It's ECDC data. The, you can see the, the countries that... So countries that are reporting... So there's some countries that are reporting incidence rates that are above 100 cases per 100,000. We're below three per 100,000. So that's many multiples of the rate of infection in this country. Obviously, travel with a country like that would be a cause for concern. So that's us. the incident cases, but in terms of trusting the data or trusting how they're reporting the data, is there any countries that are of concern? No, no, I'm not going to identify any country. I'm simply saying that we need to have okay. a system in place at a European level in which we can share information and we can have verification of that information. We, we know that we can trust the data we're receiving. Okay. Yeah. And just finally, the, you have a new publication of Stay Safe guidelines here yes. this evening. Is there uh, anything you'd like to say about that or anything new in that Smith? for people to... Or what message you'd like them to take uh, succinctly from it? Yeah, well, obviously, we're, we're now in an era where the, the risk of getting COVID is now part of our daily lives. So, uh, and it's going to remain so for the foreseeable future. So we really want to just emphasise the important message of how people can protect themselves from now on. As I said, it's here with us for the foreseeable future. So the basic public health messages remain the same. Uh, and there, there are very key things that people can do is watch their distance between individuals. Um, watch what they're doing with individuals. The, obviously, the longer the time that you spend in a, doing a particular activity is a risk. And obviously, the environment is also a, an important factor. Indoors being riskier than being outdoors, for example. So there's a nice comprehensive list of, of a to-do list in the booklet. And certainly, it should be essential reading for everyone. Because I think now's the time for everyone to be informed so that they can be safe and also to take responsibility for what they're going to do from here on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. George. Hello, Tony. George Lee uh, from RTE. Um, first, the question, I think maybe, maybe Philip might know the answer to this. Um, the incident, you know, when one looks at the different age groups which mm -hmm. we have, in terms of contact tracing, we have obviously got regular data now in terms of close contacts of those who are um, testing positive. Do we have an age breakdown? And what's in my mind is a question in my mind is, do younger people have more contacts than older people? Uh, the, the, the statisticians in the Department of Health actually have done an excellent job of pulling together that data and looking at it in detail. Um, it's not that simple a relationship. So the, the, yes, there is a relationship between age and uh, numbers of contacts. A lot of that has to do with the nature of the employment, for instance, the young person uh, uh, might be engaged in. So I think the, the more you're doing, uh, the greater your level of contact. Um, it's actually well known um, from international data around polymod that, that uh, young people do have very high levels of contact, particularly when they're in school. Um, and I, I think anecdotally it's clear, and also from the contact tracing data, that, that, that school has now been replaced with other forms of social yeah. activity. Uh, so again, I, I really want to emphasize uh, that young people have had a very difficult time over the last uh, several months in terms of the impact of uh, COVID and the public health measures on them and their lives. Uh, they've done extraordinary work to bring us to this point where, where the virus is essentially suppressed in the community. I'm just saying, can we, let's be careful not to squander this opportunity. This is not the time to move from very, very low levels of contact to super normal levels of contact and exponentially increasing the risk of transmission. This is the time to prioritize your contacts. You know, this is the opportunity to get back out there and be, be with each other in ways that sustain our economy and our mental health. And if we overdo that, we could squander that time that we have uh, to be together in a limited fashion uh, by reintroducing the disease into the community. So it's not, it's not a blame game. It's let's remind ourselves that, that we're in a very delicate position here and overdoing it for any segment in the population uh, could have us back in a circumstance where we're unable to have 
these kinds of mixing between households. So it's a question of prioritizing. We can't go back to doing everything we did the way we did it. We need to prioritize the contacts to those that are most important to us. And if we do that carefully, then we'll be able to sustain those contacts over months because we won't be transmitting the virus in the community. Okay. Uh, Tony, now I noticed that you don't want to mention countries, and I do understand that, but it does scream out about um, the difference, the one which, lay, which was, took a different approach to everybody else was Sweden. And I wonder about it because, um, to some extent, we're all Swedish now. Uh, there's much more personal responsibility. People are, you've explained, and we've explained for months the risks associated with this. We're going out into the community. We're not um, cocooning in the same way. Uh, there's a great extent to which what we are doing now is quite similar to the impression that one might have had about the Swedish approach in the beginning, where it wasn't locked down and people could do things sensibly. And I'm just struck by the numbers which were put up there, which show the incident rate mm. in Sweden today. Mm. Uh, or in the last 14 mm -hmm. days, of it's 45 times higher than ours. Mm -hmm. 152 and a half for 100,000 people versus mm -hmm. 3.4. And although one doesn't want to make comparisons with countries, but is there a lesson there about the risks that we are taking uh, if the approach, which is a more relaxed approach to lockdown, which the Swedish have taken, has resulted in today them having 45 times more the incidents that we're playing to some extent a dangerous game if people don't pay attention to the rules and to their messages, which Philip has just outlined and that you continue to outline. Sweden tells us something, does it not? Uh, it does, uh, and I think the world is learning about this infection and the measures that are needed to try to suppress it. Um, and for quite a period of time, uh, Sweden has spoken about it and none of us knew what the impact of the various measures that were taken in, those, in, in, in that particular country were. Um, there has been a challenge in terms of continuing transmission there. Um, uh, where we would agree with Sweden, and I think part of their analysis is that we can't maintain uh, the economy and society switched off in perpetuity. Uh, we know that because it has broad uh, impacts, not just on economic and social well-being, but in terms of the impact on health uh, as well. Um, uh, what we think now, we, the measures we've put in place in this country, and no two countries have put in place exactly the same set of measures there has. So there is, there's a bit of variation uh, between countries, uh, even those that appear to be very similar. Uh, they have worked in suppressing the virus to really low levels in this country. Um, uh, and and uh, what we think now is if we maintain a high level of those kinds of behaviours, and you've likened it to the kind of strategy in, that's been in Sweden, we think that that can help us to maintain suppression of the disease. Uh, and then with the vigilance that we have in terms of our systems, both the first, if you like, go back to what we would have said at the very start, the front line of this being uh, a responsible and responsive and aware public, uh, understanding symptoms, understanding how to respond to those symptoms, understanding the means to, to limit transmission, et cetera. If that's our front line. If the next line then is a really effective public health system of, of sampling, of testing, of contact tracing of those public who are coming forward responsibly, responsibly quickly to symptoms, we think those are the means that we then have to have in place to try to ensure that we, if, there, if, if we do see a change in the instance of the disease, if something is to happen, if we're to see a local outbreak, if we're to see in this country a, a more generalised resurgence, that we pick that up quickly and that if further measures are necessary, that, that, that we recommend what those fur, further, measure, further measures uh, um, will be. But there is, you're right to say, uh, a substantial variation in the incidence between countries. Um, Sweden is at the moment... Um, uh, has a high incidence, at least in relative terms, compared to many other um, European countries. But there are quite a number of other countries that are up uh, in a situation where their most recent 14-day incidence is many multiples of the, um, it might not be 45 times, but it's still many, many multiples of the incidence rate that we've reported in the most recent 14 days, which is why our, 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 our urging of caution. And it's also why we think we can't produce a list of countries that might meet a criterion in, in three weeks' time. Uh, if we were to look right now, um, you can see what kinds of countries we'd, we'd, be, we'd be concerned about. I think the lesson to be learned from Sweden is you have to suppress the disease. In before, the first place. In first. the first place, yeah. before you can relax. And if the disease resurges, you have to suppress it. You can't take a relaxed approach to this virus. 
the and base. I suppose from the clinical side, mm. if you look back to where we were three or four months ago, we've had a massive benefit in this country from the fact that we were a couple of weeks behind Northern Europe and Spain. We saw what happens in those intensive mm. care units and those residential care facilities. We really, really don't want to go back there. So it's very important, even if we are a tiny bit behind the opening up in Europe, we're still in a position to learn from what's happening in Europe. And I know Philip's team is watching that very carefully. So I would go in with what Tony has been saying and Philip and, and Alan, we can't be careful enough about our personal behaviours when we're out and about. Of course, we have to start going out and about again, start mixing again. But we do need to really stick to our respiratory etiquette, keep our distance and keep our social, keep our social groups relatively small in so far as possible. Okay. Um, if, yeah. if I don't one final thing to this, George, uh, go, go to the most recent ECDC guidance, which is uh, it's two weeks ago today, I think it was published, the 10th um, risk assessment. That has a, a table of uh, in it of the kinds of measures, what they call non-pharmaceutical interventions, so the kind of social restrictions that we've had in place here, the kinds of ones that they think will be needed in some way into the future after countries complete these phases of easing of restrictions. And there are things like mass gathering restrictions, a range of social distancing measures, and other measures that the ECDC is recommending countries have on their menu, if you like, on a continuing basis. So in that sense, uh, there isn't going to be a going back to normal uh, in the way that we had activity before. We will have to maintain, if you like, a blend of, the, of these kinds of measures in perpetuity, even if we, we, we get through the four phases, and we're now at the start of phase three, uh, if we get through the four phases successfully in disease terms, we'll still have to maintain uh, an, a range of measures across society, as well as some of the kinds of very important public health behaviours that we've, we've continued to emphasise. New normal as such. <coughs> exactly. Okay, there are two, just two other issues, if I wouldn't mind mentioning. They both were out today. Uh, one was that the, the Minister for Health announced that he has signed Ireland up to this solidarity, COVID-19 solidarity trial. Uh, which I understand is testing at about four drugs, such as remdesivir and so on. Uh, how important is that decision, and how useful is that decision for us to be signed up to that? Well, it's important that we're part of both uh, international solidarity and that we're part of the international research effort. Uh, this is a new virus. Um, uh, there is, um, uh, um, uh, we're still in a situation where we have very few in the way of proven interventions. We don't really have any new drugs available for this disease. Uh, relative to where we were back in February. And the only way we're going to be, to be able to establish uh, is, to, is to be part of international efforts, uh, consolidated, well-structured, uh, of the kind that WHO is in place that we're now signed up to. So that's really good news for us. And the second thing is, is related to the app, the, the contact tracing app. Uh, and I think what came out today was more about bringing the public with uh, the app as such, because it was about publishing... Um, the, the, the data commissioner's report on it, publishing the source code, publishing information about it. And yet I know internationally there appears to be some questions about some of these apps. So I'm wondering where we are on this app. Obviously, we're trying to, you're trying to inform the public that information, if they use this app, will not be kept. It'll be uh, anonymized and so on. And an education process is important. But um, the international concerns about it uh, are what's ringing in my ear. I mean, is there clarity? Are we, are we at the point of using this app, which other countries have a uh, difficulty with, or where are we on that? So there's a little more work remaining to be done, but it's at a very advanced stage. We had uh, a presentation from the team at the NEFIT last week that were involved in developing this, and they're very close in technical terms to the finality uh, um, around it and, and close to a point of deployment, but we're not quite there yet. I can't give you a precise timeline in relation to it. I'm not being evasive. I simply just don't know um, uh, speaking to you right now. Um, what I'd say is that our focus has been to try and maximize um, the, the effort that goes into, if you, if you like, the traditional form of t tracing of contacts mm -hmm. and adding new policy dimensions to that. So speedy investigation uh, and interview of contacts reporting in public on our performance in relation to that, and that's gotten really good now in the HSC, training up the teams and the resilience to be able to do that. Uh, and then now also things like testing on day zero and day seven of those contacts. And we think that that's the effective means uh, for us of managing contact tracing and ensuring that our focus goes on that in the first instance. The app then offers the potential to identify contacts that, that you don't know about yourself, because ultimately, traditional method of identifying contacts is based on an interview and an individual knowing about their contacts and being able to report who they had contact with. Uh, if, if contacts arise to other means, the app 
offers the potential to identify perhaps some of those. But you're right, I think the international experience has been has been variable in terms of uh, both intended uptake and, and application, and I think it also in terms of numbers of actual contacts identified. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, George. Paul Cullen from the Irish Times. Um, do you have any information or other uh, data for us um, in relation to level of compliance by people with this passenger location form, uh, uh, and, and also about how how they can be contact? Are they being con are they contactable when they emerge that they need to be contacted? People, I'm thinking from people coming in from overseas. Um, I don't have the precise data, but yes, there, there, that that data does exist, and I've heard it quoted before. The the, the percentage that are reporting, but um, um, it improved at all. Uh, there has been some improvement in it, mm. uh, but the question of, let's, let's say, authentic information, does it, are people at the stated address or are people uh, offering correct uh, data? So, there, so some of the measures that were announced yesterday as a result of government's decision were about uh, ensuring that we have verification processes and that there's a linkage between the, the completion of that information, ideally electronically, and the issuing of boarding cards and things like that that would greatly drive up both the, the compliance with and the accuracy of the information. So maybe at next week's briefing or something, we might get an update. Yeah, we can. We, we yeah, we can. We, we we can get that data for Monday's briefing. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. on the issue of the, the green list and and the travel, I mean, would you accept that it, it's possible to construct a European-wide um, system under the ECTC or the European Commission uh, for allowing travel between countries, or do you think that Ireland should go its own way and and form its own criteria? Well, uh, countries will have to make their own individual assessments because ultimately member state responsibility, sorry, responsibility for public health rests with individual member states. So the responsibility for the health and well-being of the people of this country doesn't reside with Europe, it resides with us. Um, but but uh, efforts at a European level to come up with a common mechanism and clear criteria uh, and uh, a method of, of providing verification of that, there are efforts underway. Uh, through work both um, in the Commission and the ECDC, and we're participating in that as a country. Um, but there will be third countries, and Europe is trying to take a common approach to third countries, in other words, countries that are not part of the European Union. Um, uh, and then individual countries vary within Europe in terms of their travel relationships. So there will be countries in Europe that might have a very close relationship with, for example, South America. There will be very little in the way of South American travel to here or maybe Scandinavia, but that mightn't be the case for Portugal or Spain, for example. So, so countries have to make individual assessments as well of these kinds of, 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 of uh, situations. But the ideal would be that we'd be using common criteria and that we'd have the same process of verification. But that's not where we are right now. And wh what is NEFA's current position on, on any easing of uh, travel restrictions in terms of the locator form or the quarantine that kind of goes, goes with that? Uh, so it's not an easing of measures, uh, it's a strengthening of measures is what our advice has been, uh, and a strengthening of measures because of our concern, which I think the evidence of recent transmission across Europe has only served to provide further evidence to support that concern, uh, that this is a virus that transmits easily, that resurgence uh, is something that's a very real risk in countries, and we've now seen this in a number of European countries, albeit uh, in, in confined, perhaps, situations where those countries are in a position to manage that. Uh, and so we continue to express the view that we're concerned about the risk of international travel and we support the position of the Irish government as it stands at the moment that non-essential travel is something that's recommended against. And, and methods are happening now with European cooperation to try to find a means through which countries that have verifiably safe transmission rates relative to one another can share um, 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 travel arrangements. But that's work that's underway in respect of a set, a set of countries that hasn't yet been identified. That's, that's work to be done uh, towards the 9th of July. That's not, the se that's not me saying that on the 10th of July there'll be a list of countries and we can identify what those countries are and that people will start making arrangements today. We don't know what countries will be on that list on the 9th of July. And do you know when that list might emerge? If well, it'll have to emerge very close to the 9th of July to have any meaning. I mean, like a list that appears on the 1st of July in respect of the 9th of July I wouldn't use it for my travel arrangements. Okay, okay thanks. Thanks, Paul. Sarah, Sarah. Um, just wondering, I was asking you last week, is there any update on the antibody test? Has there been much take-up? I know the letters were only sent out maybe like a week or two ago. 
Just wondering, has there been much interest in it? It's only got started, Sarah, so we okay. don't know yet. I can't say that, but we can find out for you. I, yeah. I do know that I, I do know that, that there, was, there was a reasonable level of take-up, and it gives me the opportunity to say, look, if, if you are somebody who's been approached to, it's really important that people would participate in this and give their consent to participating and participate actively. The greater the percentage of people that we have participating in this, the better and more valid the, the results will be. So if you are a person out there somewhere listening to this or hearing about this and you have been approached to participate in this Sir Prevence survey, we'd really appreciate if you would agree to do that. And the more people we have participating, the more valuable this people, piece of work will be. Brilliant. Thank you. Great. Thank you.